For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, For the ones who get it done. This week's podcast is brought to you by Kensington. With the smallest act of courage can come the power to change everything. Coal River is the haunting new historical novel by Ellen Marie Weissman, internationally acclaimed author of What She Left Behind. A woman reeling from the death of her family is sent to live with abusive relatives in a Pennsylvania coal town. There, she encounters broken young boys working under atrocious conditions. Her concern for them opens a window into the suffering of minors, the key to healing her past, and a budding love for a charismatic activist at the brink of organizing a very dangerous strike. Coal River by Ellen Marie Weissman is now available everywhere books are sold and at kensingtonbooks.com. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Glider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. We have shows coming up December 9th in New York City and December 1st and 16th in Boston. Go to storycollider.org for more. This week's story is from Alan Guth. It was recorded in April 2015 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. I think it's probably the dream of most any scientist to become part of an important scientific discovery, one that really changes the way the world thinks about some particular aspect of nature. <clears throat> On December 6th, 1979, uh, I was lucky enough to become, uh, to have exactly that experience. Uh, by chance, almost all the pieces of information had fallen into my lap, and all I really needed to do was to put it together. It was a real case of uh, scientific serendipity uh, in that what I found that night uh, was not merely an answer to the question I was working on, uh, but in fact uh, gave a possible answer to one of the important uh, fundamental problems in cosmology. Uh, at this time, I was a postdoc uh, at SLAC at an, in a, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center uh, in a one-year visiting position. Uh, it was my ninth year of being a postdoc, uh, which was probably a record, at least among my own friends. <laughs> uh, I was married. Um, I had a two-year-old son, Larry. Uh, and the family was becoming a little stressed at all the moving and the lack of job security. Uh, my real dream was to join the faculty at MIT, where I had been both an undergrad and a grad student. Uh, but so far, I didn't have any faculty offers anywhere. Uh, the project I was working on was one that uh, I started the year before when I was a postdoc at Cornell, uh, when I got uh, persuaded by a fellow postdoc uh, named Henry Tai uh, to work with him on what to me seemed like a somewhat oddball kind of project. Uh, we were trying to figure out how many of a certain kind of particle called a magnetic monopole would have been produced in the Big Bang if a certain kind of a theory called a grand unified theory uh, was right. Uh, a magnetic monopole, by the way, is a particle with a net magnetic charge, north or south, unlike an ordinary magnet, which always has both. Um, we had already learned uh, that uh, if grand unified theories and conventional cosmology were both right, uh, far too many of these magnetic monopoles would have been produced in the Big Bang. Uh, the universe under these circumstances uh, would have been swimming with them. Uh, but in fact, uh, as you probably know, nobody has yet found a single one. Uh, so we were trying to figure out uh, whether there's anything that could be changed in either grand unified theories or in cosmology uh, to get around this magnetic monopole glut uh, and make grand unified theories consistent with cosmology. Uh, by 1979, by December of 1979, we had a possible answer. Uh, we knew that the, according to grand unified theories, uh, the early universe, as it cooled, uh, would have gone through a phase transition, uh, very similar to the way water freezes into ice. 
Uh, and it was at this phase transition uh, that the magnetic monopoles uh, would have been produced. Uh, we figured out, according to our calculations, that the production of magnetic monopoles could be tremendously suppressed uh, if this phase transition did not happen right away, uh, but instead only happened after a tremendous amount of supercooling. Uh, by supercooling, I'm referring to the way liquids and gases can sometimes be cooled far below their freezing points without them actually freezing. Uh, water, for example, I'm told, according to the Wikipedia anyway, uh, can be <laughs> cooled uh, more than 80 degrees Fahrenheit uh, below its freezing point without freezing. Um, so at this point, we were busily writing a paper about how this supercooling uh, could have uh, cured the magnetic monopole problem and made grand unified theories consistent with cosmology. But uh, while we were doing this work, uh, we had been essentially blindly assuming that while the supercooling was going on, the universe would have gone on expanding uh, in exactly the same way as it would have otherwise. Uh, it was Henry uh, who suggested that we really should look at that assumption. Uh, so on December 6th, 1979, I sat down on my desk to do exactly that. Uh, the equations were actually pretty straightforward, and uh, once I wrote them down, it was really rather apparent uh, that the supercooling would affect the expansion of the universe, it would have a tremendous effect. It would drive the universe into a period of extremely rapid exponential expansion. Uh, and I realized that same evening, uh, that this exponential expansion at least had a very good chance of solving uh, a very fundamental problem in cosmology uh, that I had learned about a year before in a lecture that I happened to go to. Uh, the problem is related to the expansion rate of the early universe and what would have happened if it had been a little bit different from what we think it was. Uh, the surprising fact is that the tiniest of differences uh, would make a tremendous difference to how the universe would evolve. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you go back to one second after the beginning, uh, the expansion rate at that time, if it were a little faster by just one digit in the 15th decimal place, uh, would have caused the universe to fly apart so fast uh, that there would not have been time to form galaxies, stars, or us. Uh, on the other hand, if the expansion rate at that time had been just a little slower, again by just one digit in the 15th decimal place, uh, then the universe would have recollapsed too fast to form galaxies, stars, or people. Um, it was a serious problem because nobody knew what determined the initial expansion rate of the universe, and nobody had any idea why it should have had so precisely exactly that value. Uh, it was called the flatness problem, uh, because the desired expansion rate uh, was exactly the rate that, according to general relativity, uh, would make the universe geometrically flat, that is described by the good old-fashioned Euclidean geometry that we all learned in high school. Uh, so I was pretty sure that this exponential expansion would cure this problem, uh, because as the exponential expansion was taking place, I realized that the universe would get flatter and flatter just because it was getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so in this picture, the universe would look flat uh, for pretty much the same reason that the surface of the Earth looks flat to us, even though we know the Earth is really round. When you look at a tiny part of a curved surface, uh, it tends to look extremely flat. Um, but I was still worried about it because it seemed too good to be true. Uh, and I had never really looked in detail at this so-called flatness problem. Um, so it was possible that I wasn't really understanding it right and that maybe all of this was nonsense. Uh, but my scratch calculations that night uh, seemed to show that it would work. Uh, I uh, continued until about uh, 1.15 when I finally got tired and uh, went to sleep. Um, but I thought maybe I was onto something. Uh, the next morning, I woke up, uh, told my wife, Susan, that uh, I thought I had found something very interesting in my calculations the night before, uh, and then I biked off to Slack. Uh, I was sufficiently excited that I set a new personal bicycling record, uh, <laughs> shaving, shaving a whole two seconds off the record <laughs> I had set the previous month. I got to my office <clears throat> and excitedly started to go over the scratch calculations I had done the night before, uh, trying to write all the equations very neatly and carefully so I could really be sure that, that it was right. Um, spectacular realization, I wrote in double box on top of the page. 
I chose the mood I was in. Uh, and the calculations went very well. Uh, by noon, I was able to completely reproduce the calculations of this flatness problem, uh, getting exactly the numbers that I had heard in the lecture the year before, which made me really feel confident. Uh, so I became convinced that I did understand this flatness problem and that I really had found what at least looks like uh, a very attractive solution. Uh, it still, however, seemed too good to be true, so I was still very nervous about it. Uh, I knew that I did not know very much cosmology. My previous experiment, experience was really all in particle theory. Uh, so there were lots of things I did not know about cosmology, and I thought that maybe something would come along that would uh, cause this to all turn out to be wrong. Uh, my fears were not completely idle, actually, because, in fact, uh, later that spring, uh, I, with help of others, uh, discovered that in my original version of this exponential expansion picture, which I came to call inflation, uh, the ending did not work. Um, I was, of course, very disappointed about that, but I still vaguely clung to the hope that maybe a different ending could be found. Uh, and that, in fact, did turn out to be the case. About a year, a little more than a year later, uh, a new ending was worked out by Andre Linde and independently by Andy Albrecht and Paul Steinhardt, uh, which came to be called New Inflation. Uh, getting back to 1979, uh, I first told Henry about this uh, early the next week, um, and I didn't really know what to expect about Henry's reaction. And I have to explain to you the circumstances so you'll understand why. Uh, the first important fact is that I am one of the slowest writers of papers in all of physics. Uh, so it's always the case that my collaborators want to get a paper submitted, and I'd like to once more check over the equations and the assumptions and then maybe check them over again. Uh, and in this case, that situation was exacerbated uh, by the fact that Henry was about to leave, 10 days later actually, um, for a six-week trip to the People's Republic of China. Now, six weeks sounded like infinity to us, uh, and at this time, uh, China was like the far side of the moon. There was really no hope of communicating while he was in China. Uh, our paper about supercooling was, uh, we had a full draft of it at this point, uh, but it was 20% too long to be published in the physical review letters, which was where we wanted to publish it. Uh, so we really had a strong motivation to get this paper finished and just enough time really to get it finished. Uh, so Henry and I agreed that we would go ahead and edit the paper, uh, ignoring this issue of exponential expansion. Uh, it also turned out, that I only learned much later, uh, that although Henry had been at the same talk about the flatness problem that I had been at, uh, he had sat in the back and could hardly hear what the speaker was mumbling about. And he really didn't know anything about this flatness problem. So, so my spiel about how important it was to him probably didn't make any sense at all. Uh, in any case, uh, he and I uh, finished editing the paper and did indeed get it off to the journal just before he left on his trip. Uh, and I asked him if it was okay with him if I continued thinking about this exponential expansion and maybe wrote a paper about it. Uh, and he said, fine, go ahead and do that. Uh, so that's the direction things went. Uh, this concept called uh, inflation uh, had its debut uh, about a month later in, on January 23rd of 1980. Uh, I gave a talk about it at Slack. Uh, the title being 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. Uh, the talk, uh, in terms of the interest it, drew, drew, it, it created, uh, was really a fantastic success. Um, it was scheduled for an hour, but it talk, took about an hour and a half. Um, afterwards, I was speaking to uh, Sidney Coleman, who is really one of my heroes, a very prominent theoretical physicist who was visiting at Slack from Harvard. And I asked him, uh, what do you think I should leave out? Uh, and I remember his words exactly. Uh, he said, nothing. Every word was pure gold. And coming from someone I respected as much as Sidney Coleman, that was really just knocked me off my feet. Uh, the word about inflation uh, spread very quickly, I think largely due to the influence of Sidney Coleman. Uh, so really, by the next day, uh, I was asked to repeat the seminar on the main Stanford campus for some of the people who didn't come to Slack. Uh, I was asked to give a seminar of the same type at the University of California at Santa Barbara and at the University of California at San Diego. And I was also informed uh, that the University of California at Davis and the University of Pennsylvania were very interested in me for a faculty job. 
Um, and all this communication happened years before the internet. I don't really know how it happened, but, but, but it did. Um, uh, so, um, uh, in addition, I had put off asking the people at Stanford uh, that maybe could I stay another year at Slack uh, until after the seminar, uh, but I told them then, and uh, the same day they came back and offered me a three-year position. It was, uh, so I really felt uh, that I was suddenly entered an entirely new universe. Um, in February, um, I started a six-week trip around the country giving talks at various universities uh, that had been expressed some interest in possibly offering me a job. Uh, and by the end of the trip, I had, had eight offers. Uh, but I really wanted to be at MIT. Uh, during the trip, I visited MIT, but MIT did not advertise any jobs that year, so I didn't apply, and the topic uh, just never came up. Uh, on the last night of my trip around the country, I was at the University of Maryland, and they took me out for a Chinese dinner, which is a very common custom among physicists at that time. Uh, so I, had, I got a fortune cookie uh, with a surprisingly relevant message, and I'm not kidding about this, this really is what it said. It said, an exciting opportunity awaits you if, if you are not too timid. So the next morning I flew home, it was a Saturday, uh, spent the weekend with my family and thinking about the fortune cookie. and. Uh, <laughs> I, I decided that the cookie was right. If I really wanted to be at MIT, uh, I sure had nothing to gain by being timid. Uh, so on Monday, I worked up the, uh, <clears throat> the courage to uh, call uh, Jeffrey Goldstone, one of the senior physicists at MIT. And um, I didn't really know what to say or how to say this, but it probably came out something like, um, 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 uh, there, there weren't any jobs at MIT this year, so I, so I, did, so I didn't apply, but uh, I would like you to know that if, uh, I would be very interested in MIT, you know, if you could consider me. Um, in any case, I, to my absolute delight and shock, uh, the next day the director of the Center for Theoretical Physics at MIT called and said that they had decided to offer me an associate professorship. Great. Thank you. Uh, so it took about two and a half weeks to make that official, and then I accepted it. Uh, three days later, I was having lunch at a Chinese restaurant uh, <laughs> near Slack and got another fortune cookie. Do not act on the impulse of the moment, it said. <laughs> but what would a Chinese fortune cookie know anyway, I thought. <laughs> and I've been happy at MIT ever since. Thank you. That was Ellen Guth. Ellen is the Victor F. Weisskopf Professor of Physics and a McVicker Faculty Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Trained in particle theory at MIT, Guth held postdoc positions at Princeton, Columbia, Cornell, and the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center before returning to MIT as a faculty member in 1980. Guth has written a popular book called The Inflationary Universe, The Quest for a New Theory of Cosmic Origins. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, R.A. Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, Justin D'Ambrosio, and the theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, to everyone at the Cambridge Science Festival for incredible help, and to turkeys. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.